Hey everybody, welcome again to uh, another edition of Forward Focus Thursday. We thank you for coming out to be with us today and to uh, just to take a few minutes out of your day to share with us. And I thank you. We thank you. I uh, thank our team again, Brother Alan Lavender, Reverend Sandra Pace, Sister Letitia Frey. I want to thank the wonderful uh, panel we always have, um, Reverend Stephen Cousin Jr., uh, Reverend Dr. Michael A. Cousin Sr., Reverend Stephen A. Cousin Sr., Reverend Philip R. Cousin Jr., and of course, Bishop Philip R. Cousin Sr. We thank everybody and just want to um, praise God for you for coming out to be with us today. Because again, we know you could have spent your Thursday doing many other things, but we thank you for just coming out to be with us for a little while. So as we begin, let's just as always bow our heads uh, for a moment of prayer. We always try to open in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this gathering and this time you've given us, we ask, Lord, that you would allow us to remember our mission, that this is Forward Focus Thursday. So we pray that someone leaves better than they came in and allows this to be the day that they decide not to turn back, but to move forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what's going on, everybody? How y'all doing? I'm okay. Everybody's good? Yeah, I'm I'm hanging in there. Just want to let you know that Stevie um uh, gets his first um COVID shot today, and so um it's gonna be some press around it where kids are able to get vaccinated. So he's gonna be one of the first ones in the state of Connecticut to receive his his shot. So we're looking forward to that. So you just put poor Stevie wow. right on the front line, huh? Well, you know they already did the clinical trials in the summer. He was not part of that. But you know, now that the FDA has approved it, all systems go. Good. He carries my name. Yeah. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I'll I say feel pretty good. I went, went to, went to ahead, the doctor David. yesterday. Went to the doctor yesterday and uh, got a shot in my hip. And I'm feeling much better. I'm able to walk without my cane for another 30 days. <laughs> so I'll be fed. Praise the Lord. Yep, good. Praise the Lord. I've been working on uh, Merlene Akers Memorial Celebration. Uh, Merlene was a renowned musician. Uh, James Cleveland said that she was one of the three top pianists in uh, the country. She was really something. It's been it's been a work, a mighty work, believe me. I have to record the Reverend Shaveen Jones today. I think he's gonna sing. Oh, so it's yeah. gonna be filled with a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of notable people at her memorial celebration this Saturday at one o'clock uh central daylight time on our Facebook page, Trinity Amy Church at Facebook Live or Facebook Live at Trinity Amy Church, whichever way it is. One o'clock Saturday. Uncle Phil, what about you, Uncle Mike? Uncle Mike, um, oh. well, here doing well. Um, weather changing, getting cooler, so um, yes, it's always good to see family at such a time as this. Looking forward to today's discussion. It's just good to be here, Steve. I'm happy to be able to share this time. See my family on Zoom. Amen. Yep. 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 Well, the question that, that we wanted to pose today, and we, we started talking about it amongst ourselves yesterday, and that was, you know, the elections. Um, some of the hotly contested or some of the more recognizable elections was the governor's race down in Virginia and then the governor's race in, in New Jersey where we did see how a, a Republican actually took over um, the governorship in, in Virginia with Trump policy, so to speak, but a milder version uh, of Trump. And the Republican almost overtook um, Governor Phil Murphy in, in New Jersey, where it was too close to call, even as early as yesterday morning, before they finally did call it for um, Governor Murphy where it would have been breaking a 40 year tradition 
if um, Governor Murphy um, would have actually lost, where normally whoever is the president of whatever party, New Jersey always goes with the opposite party. And so it's the first time where it has not happened, where now I'm a Democrat can actually still be the governor as the president of the United States. So I just want to get your assessment of what do you think about the elections, the topics, the trends, what was on voters' minds? What did you see play out in this election season so far? All right, well, I'll be happy to, to weigh in because I was absent yesterday. But uh, the, the, what the elections show about America is that, that the country is still very much divided and still very much dysfunctional. What they want to do is have now a version to present to America for the midterms and for the next presidential cycle of something I call Trump light. They want all the policies without the personality. But the simple truth of the matter is you can separate the personality from the policy, but the policy is still the policy. And the country is still very much sick. When you get a jury that is all white and one black man to look into the wrongful death of a black man in, a, in, in America today, in 2021, when you have people who ab ab absolutely contrive notions that are at best inane and asinine as trying to give rationale for why they are uh, they, they vote a certain way and, and why they support uh, certain views when, when all it is is, is, is different, it's, it's different ways of, of, uh, of encouraging language. All the, all the critical talk now about critical race theory. Well, critical race theory goes by another name too. It's called the truth. <laughs> you know, so you, you, you're, you're opposing the teaching of critical race theory? No, you are opposing the teaching of the truth because you feel it is too yeah. sensitive for, the, for the, the little ears of little white girls and boys. But, but America has got to, to, to start calling it like it is because nomenclature is everything. One six was not an attack on democracy. January 6th was an attack on America. People hear an attack on democracy and think, some of them absolutely think that's an attack on the Democratic Party. No, the insurrection was not an attack on democracy. The insurrection was an attack on America. America is built upon a democracy. It was an attack upon America. And if people realize that, more folk might line up with what is reality as opposed to these variants of reality now that are controlling American politics. Yeah. The, the, the fact that the Democratic Party controls all three branches of the government and can accomplish nothing speaks to the massive dysfunction in our, in our system. When, when, when clearly in the Senate, you've got one woman who is thirsty for attention, and that's why she's holding out. And you have another senator from, uh, from West Virginia who is a Democrat in name only. I'll stop. But here's the thing. Under, uh, under those circumstances, we're at the Republican Party. The first thing Trump would say is, we're going to primary those people. We're going we, we, we to fix it so they can't, you know, so they can't continue. But I don't know. We're just trying to be so nice. Democrats are trying to be so nice and so easy, you know, but you can't be nice with uh, folk who are bent on destroying. You can't be nice to them. You have to stand up, stand up to them and, and, and do what's right. I mean, that is, that is ridiculous. Manchin needs to go somewhere and sit down. He's not a Democrat. I don't know what he is. Uh, Kristen, Kristen Cinema, she's terrible. They need to go. That's all it is to it because we cannot go forward unless they get out. Praise God. I, I listening to, to both comments, I think that uh, you're right on point with critical race theory of being the truth. I think time is now that 
um, was really listening to an interview yesterday with Trevor Noah. And he said he before he took over as the host of The Daily Show, he would watch CNN, Fox, MSNBC, and everything else to try to get the news. And some of the writers told him, don't do that. So because you're not getting news, you're getting points of view. But he would go overseas and get how we are viewed overseas. And uh, the news is boring, but it's factual. So I think what we see now is we're dealing with ratings more so than facts. Um, I'm not surprised with Virginia. It was 1967 for they were able to repeal the law that interracial dating was unlawful. Even when Brown versus Board of Education was passed, the law of the land, they still didn't recognize it in Virginia. So this, this is, you know, I think now that uh, that is something that the critical race theory help us to remove those things, those shaded, those shaded nuances of history. I think children now, we must give them more credit than, than, uh, than what is given to them, because I think they are ready to accept the truth. You know, George Washington did not chop down a cherry tree and say, I cannot tell a lie. You know, I was reading an article today about Walt Whitman, where Walt Whitman, although he talked about leaves of autumn and everything else, he had a he he had quotes about black folk that were just shameful. And so you know, I I think that with this, a good dose of the truth would help us and would give us direction that we 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 will be able to have a serious dialogue and say, do we do we live together as brothers or do we perish apart as fools? Uh, so we just I mean, yesterday was just a gauge of one part, but not but not necessarily the total picture. Um, thank goodness that New Jersey held strong, uh, held serve, and um, I think there is some hope in that, where the Democrats have to get out and give a message and not be nice. You can't go to a gunfight with a uh, with a switchblade. Right, right. So, and so, you know what? That's, what that's a way of witnessing. How, how much? Right. Of this, how much of this also speaks to um, not you know obviously the the, the race, racism and the racial undertones. Are in, are in all of it, but how much of it also speaks to just the fickle nature and the, um, the whimsical nature and the unsatisfied nature of, of people? They're never happy, they're never satisfied. So we're gonna try this one, we're gonna try that one, we're gonna see about this one, we're gonna see about that one. And when you throw in the racist undertones, it makes it all the more you know appealing to people. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's all about spin. The politics is about spin. Unfortunately, now the news cycle has become about spin. It's 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 like was said was said earlier. People don't want the news. People want a perspective. They want they want a perspective. You know, every, everyone pretty much knows in our in our news cycle, uh, particularly the, the the cable news, we've got we've got Goldilocks perspectives. You've got. Uh, You've got MSNBC, which is too hot, and Fox, which is too cold, and CNN, which is just right. And, and it's, all about, it's all about spin and, and perspective. And people won't connect dots. You know, why is Joe Manchin so opposed to any kind of, of climate uh, improving initiatives? Well, just look to his own personal holdings and portfolio and see how heavily vested he is in the coal industry, right there in the state of West Virginia, and so you, you can't talk about you can't talk about holding a position as a matter of principle when you are actually holding that position as a matter of your pocketbook. But but nobody wants to nobody wants to trace that and 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 uh, and and follow that. It, it, there, there's no you know there's no uh, accountability anymore. To, for, for party standards. And it, it's sad that it looks like the Democrats have to stop playing like the Republicans who have absolutely uh, all of the morals of a wharf rat. And, <laughs> uh, and, and that, that's, a sad, that's a sad thing to see that in order to win, we're gonna have to play down at, at their level. That's but, right. But that is, that is uh, what, it, what it looks like. The Republicans, no one has called them to task as to their opposition to voting rights. What, what, you know, 
they, they, what, why, why is that? Why is the, the smoke screen uh, abortion? And as long as that remains the issue and at the front, it pushes voting rights to the, to the, to the rear, and we're going to look up and we're going to find ourselves back to counting bubbles in a bar of ivory soap and jelly beans in a jar to determine whether or not people of color in this country can vote. We are slowly slipping. And I have to hand, I, I don't admire them, but I have to acknowledge the, 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 the insidious yet effective nature of their tactics because the Republicans have managed to find a way to allow their negativity to still win, even though they are the party not in control. Um, just and just to, um, to your point before I'm really need to let granddad weigh in on this. I do believe the Senate as of yesterday actually um, dropped the ball for the Voting Rights Act due to the threat of a filibuster. So once again, it was going to be brought up, but they threatened the filibuster. So it got shut down again uh, for for that particular um, agenda item. Granddad, what were you going to say? The, the, we, we have to understand that the whole thing that is is really captivating what's happening in this in this nation is the fear of those who have been in charge are losing their grip and people right. who have had you under their shoe their heel for over 200 years and now you see the thought of it coming look at the way the Congress is constituted. And you see all those little states with nobody. You have, you have a couple of states in, in, in the far in, in the far Midwest. You got one city in one other state got more mem members than they have, yet they got two senators, they got representatives. You got DC, which is larger than some of the states out west no voting rights, no senators. There is a fear that they are losing their grip. And when you, a, a fearful person is a difficult person to deal with. You see, we don't, I don't, I have been watching CNN for a long time, but I'm about ready to stop. I'm tired of CNN trying to apologize for what Fox is doing. Don't give me no logia on, on what Fox is doing. Don't come to, oh yeah, we, Tucker Carlson took him to court and the court ruled, you can't believe nothing Tucker says, so just let him go ahead and say it. And then they don't say nothing about it. I, I, I don't want any more trying to cover and say that. They almost, Dana Bash really almost made me tear up my hair last night, a couple of nights ago, as, as to how wishy-washy she sounded. If you're going to be in a struggle, keep your side up. You can't make no cover up and say no apology for what the Republicans are doing. They, they are being held together by the strongest, one of the strongest emotions that keep radicals in line, fear. They are fearful. Amen. And you look and see how in, the, how in the world can people who are supposed to be able to read and write and listen, can see what happened in one six and say, oh, that wasn't nothing there. Wasn't nothing there. And they don't believe it. You, you, you just, it's fear. Fear has gone through that small portion of our nation, which, 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 which is now being caught up in the throes of how we're going to. Don't make no mistake about Virginia. Virginia from, from, from Richmond South, ain't nothing but from Massachusetts West and, and South. And what kept Virginia and made it be partially purple was the fact that you had a number of people who commuted over to Washington and lived in Virginia, voted. But now, one, one thing you have to understand, look at them and see. And they ain't so happy either when they when they look and see. The, it, it, you know, I, I, I worked I worked very hard, very hard for a long time. Uh, I, the boys ought to know for a long time I wore nothing white. I would not wear a white shirt. I don't even wear a white t-shirt now. Because 
and anything white re 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 reminds me of, of what of what I had to go through in order to be where I am. So I guess I took mine out in a different way. I don't want nothing white around me because to have something white around me reminded me of how the struggle was such a horrifying experience for those of us who lived through the 40s and the early 50s. And when I wake up every morning, I can turn, close my eyes and see I'm right back in 64 all over again, all over again. The only difference is at that time, you had a Southerner in the White House who had some understanding of politics, but who said, if you pass this Voting Rights Act, if you give the Civil Rights Movement, you just gave the South over to the Republicans. And Lyndon B. Johnson was totally correct. We passed it, but then what happened? There was no Republican Party in the South, but the Democrats who thought that the Democratic Party had gotten too liberal all became Dixiecrats. Then from Dixiecrats, they became strong, solid Republicans. And that's about where we are right now. Right. We're, and then to have people making an ap apology for that, it, that really grinds me hard. It, it's hard for me to see. And, and for some black folk to, to jump up and, and shout before you hear the sermon. Don't ever shout before you hear the sermon. Don't, don't ever get too happy for the fact that, that we had one black president. My Lord, where have we gone from the time we had that one black president? Gone. And, and we, have, we have the wrong custom in our community. If a black person gets in, we want to know, what have you done for me lately? What are you going to do right. for me now? You know, and I don't no more knock on no doors that, that they should be knocking on, but they just let it go by. But you let a black man get there, they come to you, what have you done for me lately? I know you ain't gonna do nothing. How you know that? You had on them white folk and they've been killing you for a hundred years and you ain't sitting up once. Here comes a black man and they say, what have you done for me lately? And unfortunately he's gone. And sometimes it just happens lives and seen it. It is like I am watching a rerun of all the early sixties up to all the way up to 72. I'm watching a rerun of how our country is being handled. So let me let me ask this question. Um, in terms of the black voter, where we've seen, you know, in Alabama, where because of the black vote, they're able to elect the first um US senator from the state of Alabama. Um, I want to say um Doug Jones, I think that was his name. It was Doug um, Jones. to Doug Doug Jones for to the to the Senate. We saw how, you know, because of our voting our enthusiasm, we were able to get Barack Obama elected. Uh, we saw how it was a black vote that really carried Biden into um, the 2020 uh, presidential election. But why is it that it has to take under extreme circumstances for the black vote to really turn out? Where like right now you see across the board, it was low voter turnout and really the African-Americans stayed home. Why is it that we can't sustain that energy year in and year out? Why is it that we only come to be the quote unquote savior or to rescue um, the Democratic Party? Steve, let me let me let me ask your question this way by uh, bringing to your uh, uncle's remembrance and your father's remembrance something that our father, your grandfather taught us growing up. And we it was a different time. It's not politi politically correct now. But there was a time when a father had to teach his sons how to fight when they went outside, how to fight when they went out into the world. And I never forget, one of your grandfather's guiding principles was, when you throw a punch, don't stand back and admire your work. You better follow that punch with another one if you expect to win. And that's the problem with our people in politics. We throw a punch, and then we stand back and admire our work. You know, we don't we don't follow it up. That's why the the result in most midterm elections is a complete reversal of whatever happened in a presidential contest. If we win in a presidential contest, we don't vote in the midterm. Absolutely. That's right. Because we refuse, we we simply will not follow up 
our punch. You cannot stand back and admire your work. But what I really want to add to the discussion is this. In American politics, uh, it seems by nature, it is circular in its logic. And, and one thing we can do to keep things real is to keep the logic linear. And that's to keep putting forth to white America. You may not claim to be a Trumper, but if you are a member of a party whose policies are racist, and you are a supporter of those policies, then by logic and by definition, that means you are a racist. And that has to, exactly. that has to keep washing up on the doorstep of the Republican Party as it is constituted today. You are a racist policy. If you're a racist party, if your policies are racist and you support the party and its policies, then you are a racist. Because, because right now that would be the frontal assault against Republican politics because it, 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 it dredges up all the ire in them. The last thing they want to be called is out. And when you call them racist and call right, them right. for what they represent, what they support, you are calling them out. And that's keeping it linear. And don't don't and don't allow them to get into that into that circular kind of logic where where they literally mesmerize you into believing, well, no, uh, I, I don't support uh, voters' rights, but I'm not a racist. Really? Uh, I don't I don't believe that there was anything wrong with the peaceful protest that looked like it was just a, another tour of the Capitol on January the 6th, but I'm not a racist. Yes, mm. you are. And yes, you are. Th th hold their feet. Hold their feet to that fire. Th there's a tweet out there, Phil, and you've probably seen it, and it, it circulated around, and it said, the people who threw rocks at Ruby Bridges for trying to go to school are now upset that their grandchildren might learn about them throwing rocks at Ruby Bridges for trying to go to school. That's good. That's yes, true. and that and that's the truth. And then, and then, oh, I'm sorry. I, no, I, no, Mike, I, Mike, you are, you know this better than I do. I think doesn't the woman who uh, who um, the the woman who accused Emmett Till? Yeah, Emmett. Doesn't, doesn't she live in Raleigh? I think she lives in Raleigh. Yeah. I think she lives in Raleigh, and even and even today after she has confessed that she lied and, 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 and obstructed and in effect obstructed justice, no legal system will try to prosecute her and she is very much alive. Yep. You know, uh, HBO has a uh, special, about, I think it's called Four Hours. It talks about the insurrection and the buzzword they use, they call themselves patriots. You know, patriots, patriots. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's just a veil of racism um, where they, they go through, the, they, through a, uh, if you know, a timeline of how it was planned. And there's a possibility there were some members of Congress who were behind parts of the planning that knew when it was going to uh, take place and how it was going to take place. They call that a peaceful protest and they actually beat for the Capitol policemen. I think six of them. Uh, may have committed suicide or something to that effect because of the effects of, 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 of what they went through on that day. And they actually went through the halls saying they were going to lynch Mike Pence and members of Congress. Um, and you had one woman from Texas. Here's the hypocrisy. One woman from Texas, a realtor, who went up on a chartered jet talking about she was going to protest Texas. Those people, Texas, Texas, Texas. And they did some digging and found out She's guilty of tax evasion for the past five years, never paid taxes. So now it, it, it's, it, the bottom line is, and you are right, it's, it's, it's for persons of, uh, who, who are used to being entitled and in control view themselves as losing control. Um, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, you have to let folk know that we all in the same boat and we must work together in order to deal with those that are bound together by hatred. 
Um, I think the biggest problem we have is when we come together as a coalition, when we get in, when we achieve what we are supposed to achieve, then we start letting our issues be those things that start to erode and, and uh, to divide us uh, in terms of what brought the coalition together. I don't watch Fox because Fox is uh, Hannity and Tucker. I can't watch them because they bring on black folk at certain periods, black conservatives who are just as confused as a June bug in the hen house. Uh, just as they talk about stuff that's just so far-fetched and but, make it seem like the data are the authorities of the black community. But he, and here, here's the problem, Mike. The, the reason that they didn't do anything to Tucker Carlson for saying um, erroneous things on, on air is because they deemed it to be entertainment and not news. So he's just an entertainer. So he's just entertaining. So my thing is, if you're sitting there saying that, that entertainment is entertainment and not news, I mean, that, that's, that's extremely dangerous. I mean, that's very dangerous and, and it absolutely makes no sense. So well, then Joe, don't call yourself a news channel, just call yourself uh, Fox Entertainment. That's like with wrestling. Wrestling, they just call themselves sport. But when they went to court, said they're not sport, it's entertainment. And so that's where they have WWE, World Ride Entertainment. And I think that's what you can use as an analogy for, for those shows. That, but, but our mindset was just so geared up to be hateful that mm -hmm. they take the slightest rumor and pump it up, make it seem like it's the truth. And I had a discussion Here's the thing that gets me. I had a discussion with a young black man and we talked about voter apathy. And he said that, well, well, folks didn't come out in Virginia because they're disgruntled. Black folk, that we, we're disgruntled. We voted for the lesser two evils. I said, that may be true, but mm. I'm glad to have him versus who was there. And we got into the discussion. I said, I, I can't see myself not exercising a right to vote that persons died for. And he said, oh, where do you see that uh, persons died for? I said, what do you think the freedom writers did? They knew they were going to be beaten. They knew they were going to be killed. They knew, look, 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 go down to Montgomery, see those who were lynched because they wanted to register, not to vote, but to register to vote. I, I don't see it. It's time for us to move beyond that narrative. I said, I said that's just, you know what? When we are quick to forget, I think that goes back to your point, Philip, where we throw a punch and we admire the work, but we don't realize the work is still to be done. Yeah. And unless, unless we, again, the biggest problem, when we allow our oppressors to teach our children, expect to have similar outcomes from here on out from generation to generation. Well, that's what has happened down through the years. We don't, we, we don't, we don't have an education the, in this the, country. We have indoctrination. You know, we have something called socialization. The, the problem I mean, I'm, is, I'm, for, I'm, uh, go ahead, Dan. We, we, you, you fail. You, you, you fail. To, you, you, you fail to recognize the historical context. Uh, back to the patriot. Patriots were the symbols given to those who started and kept the Civil War alive. Because they were patriots for for their way of way way of thinking, black mm. folk have been under the the hard rain calendar canopy culture lock of thinking that once you got what white folk had, you were free and evil equal, and any time so much, let's move on from this. One thing, <clears throat> I I. I really have respect for Jews. The Jews ain't going to let you ever forget what they went through. The churches. That's right. That's they, right. They teach you every, they, they're not going they're not going to let you forget who they are. That's but right. we got we we got young black folk who said let's move on. Because unfortunately for a large segment of them still and unfortunately for, for many of the rappers, I don't have no respect for now, because once they rap and get money and get out of this, they join the elitist white company. 
Look at every top rapper now. You go down the list and see where they are and see what they're locked up with. See who they're locked up with. They ain't locked up with nothing trying to bring no, 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 no relief to the black community. You see where they're locked up. They're locked up with the elitist old white men, old white culture making money. And they made their money to get where they are to lock up with them. And so anytime I hear rap, I turn it off because I say, I know your rappers ain't doing nothing but getting money so you can wrap yourself out of the community. A few rappers. One in Chicago has respect for Chance One, One Chance, or whatever his name is. He puts money back into the community. 99% of them take that money and use and lift themselves up by boats. Who is that? One, one from Atlanta went and bought an island. He could be by himself. What's his name? But bought, bought an island out there where he could be by himself. And I, and I have no and I have no kind of contact with the folk who gave him the money to help him buy the island. We have to learn that, Amen. that the problem comes from most, a lot of it from us because we taught them and them and allowed them to think anything other that if you get ahead, move up and get into the elitist class and there ain't no black elitist class. The black elitist class is second, is second. The real elitist class is the white folk who got the money. Who was that? What 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 was that comedian said? A crock. Uh, you got money, but he's rich. You know, <laughs> he, he, he he's rich. You, you just got a little money, but he's rich. Now, mm -hmm. we, we we talk about the problem. The problem is we have to change the culture. Why do black folk kill black folk? We ain't got no love for each other. Only thing we want to do is get ahead so we can be a part of the culture. It does, and and this this kind of a show that comes on that I don't watch. We 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 form our black gangs in a way that 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 that, that, that the mafia had their form. That's how we gonna succeed because we can even have our gangs like the mafia. My lord, how much how much of an influence has it boiled over, especially to our young minds that cause them. To have a young man give you the answer he gave, Michael. Let's move on from this. Or move on from where you're going. What right. you going to do? How far are you going? Like it's like what Richard Pryor said when 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 uh, when Jim Brown came to him. He's on the bed. He, he's laying there. He said to him, "All right, Rich, what you going to do? What you going? What you do? What you going to do? So I'm saying to the black community, all right, now what you going to do? What you?" Uh, I, you still dictate what's happening out of a, out of a multitude. What you do, black folks, and the black church is even more. We get excited because we can get into an interracial church, and that kind of culture has flowed into every part of our lives. And the ones who've been affected most are. Well, my brothers know what they have to do. And save our grandchildren in the years to come. What are you talking about, Phil? No, when you get to uh when you get to Chicago, you know what you need that internet connection. Y'all know what you need to do. You know, one of the things that uh the history of, of Durham, one of the at the time one of the premier neighborhoods for African Americans. Emory Wood. But come to find out that the contractor who built the houses, <laughs> I'm not going to say it because folk of Durham watching, but y'all know what I'm saying. Yeah. That he made money off of all of us. And some of those houses, you know, same design and everything else, but he made money off of us. And, and I was listening to uh, Mickey Michal, representative of uh, state senator and everything, uh, big uh, next door neighbor. He said that he went to him about that project, wanted to get in on it and to invest in it. 
but was pretty much rebuffed. But we still went with this man who made money out of everybody in that neighborhood. And uh, the name, that name of Herndon has some history to it that um, has connections. My, my thing is, you have persons talking about reminiscing and waxing uh, eloquently about Pettigrew Street and Haiti. But who killed Haiti? When we fail to support our own, instead of supporting the, the shops and the area that was self-sustaining, the restaurants, we finally had a chance to go out to Northgate. We had a chance to go over to what the North Hills, Cameron Village. We had a chance to move away and to think that moving beyond Beachwood Cemetery was the country where you had no problems out there. And in the process, we really, really abdicated what we had established. I, I, I think that in, in, in listening to what dad was saying, as we look at others, we must now begin to look at ourselves and see how we have contributed to many of the problems that we have. Um, you know, some things we need to keep in-house in dealing with and not thinking that somebody else is going to clean it or help us to do it. We must learn to do it ourselves. I had another conversation with a young man in, in Detroit oh, shit. and he used to break in houses all around the neighborhood. I just, I was, I said, man, I, said, I pulled him to the side, I said, hey man, why are you breaking in houses around here? Well, you know, most of the folk around here don't have anything, much of nothing of value in those houses. Why are you breaking them? You need to stop. And he looked at me, he said, you know, pastor, you're right. My friends and I had that discussion. We need to stop breaking in houses around here. We need to go out to those big white houses out there, Farmington Hills, and start breaking in those houses out there. I said, well, praise the Lord. At least you got one part of it. But, you know, we must be able to address and call the call into account some of the things that we have contributed to by trying to turn a blind eye to. We have, we have contributed to some of this stuff. And we must... Now, the only way we're going to get out of it is if we're willing to come together and to work to clean it up and be united. I see other people doing it now, other cultures doing it now. We must be able to follow suit and to bring into question and to call into question our direction and who will bear the blame, as Cool and the gang would say, who's going to bear the fault? I mean, who's going to bear the blame? So, you know, we must hold on to that. You know, I, I remember when the road came through the community we lived in, in Durham, in, in, in Haiti. And David and I used to fly planes all back there and, and there were houses back there. But wherever black folk get together and start to thrive, somebody's going to put a road through it, you know, do all kinds of stuff to just, just to separate, separate us. Yeah. And, I, and, and I've seen that too many times. I have a church in uh, Kansas City, Kansas. It was once a thriving community, all kinds of shops up and down the road, but they came to that call, calling themselves, you know, redeveloping. And they redeveloped us right on out of there. And that's, that, that's what they do across the board. I don't care where you go, wherever black folk get together, it seems like they're doing something. Somebody's gonna come along and put a road through it, you know, mess it up. And it's, and, and it's just ridiculous. You know, we have to start to work together. Yes, we do. We have to start supporting each other. Yes, we do. And that's one thing about the Hispanic community. They, they support each other. Oh, yeah. They support each other. And they, and they stand on each other's shoulders and they go higher and higher and higher. And then we wonder why in the world we can't do anything. I, hey, think, I think, you know, to, to Dad's point and to everybody's point here, one of the things that we lack is, is one thing to vote but we're not civically involved in all aspects 
uh, of local government, where we don't show up for zoning meetings, we don't show up for board of education meetings. Uh, all politics are, are local and just a prime example of that, uh, we have a parking lot that we own across, you know, from our, um, across our church. And next to that parking lot is a big open lot that's still owned by the city that we've been trying to get for some years, but the city would never negotiate a price. Come to find out they made a deal with another organization to build on that land, but they would need to use our parking lot for their business. Only reason why we found out about it is because I was made aware through the board of zoning. Like, hey, this is coming up. What do you want us wow. to do with this? And when we actually said, no, we don't want it, it got shut down. The problem with us is we're not really involved. And had not I was involved in the process or did not know about the board of zoning laws, or I did not know who was actually in government, that building would have came right up and we would have known nothing about it. So what I'm saying for us is one thing to vote, but we're not going to be involved locally in all aspects of, of, of government, or we don't find representatives that we actually raise up and we train to put in these positions. We're always going to be having these conversations um, year after year in, in circles. So to Uncle Phil's point, it's one thing to just punch and admire the work, but how you continue to punch is don't just vote um, at your school or at your polling place, but make sure you show up to these meetings that do occur, you know, because it is posted. Hard time trying to find it, but you got to get involved to really make the changes that are necessary. And, and the involvement, and the involvement is not as, as, as time consuming as uh, one might be led to believe. Uh, Steve, you make a good point about getting about getting to zoning. But on your way to going to city zoning, drop in city planning. Mm -hmm. Every municipality in this country has a plan at least 20 years out for what they mm -hmm. intend for that municipality to look like. And you can literally go into city planning and take a look and where the, 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 for lack of a better phrasing, where the, the, the mothers and fathers of that municipality see their city going 20 years out. And, and that's what affects wow. all of your zoning because the, the, the zoning does not occur haphazardly. Everybody coming in applying for a zoning permit has taken a look at the city plan because if, especially if they're putting in a business, they want to know if they are going to be putting in something that is going to receive enough traffic. And, and you, it, it, it allows you to follow, to follow trends. And then you can see what happens, what the plans are. And in most places, when you start looking for the plans for black neighborhoods, you discover ain't no plans. You know, the plan is to get you out. Even, even when, when the gerrymandering of redrawing district lines, congressional district lines occurs, somebody's looked at city planning. It's all right if the, and, and you watch, watch what happens, watch what happens with, with Republicans in Georgia. When they start gerrymandering those lines, and start dividing areas where you have uh, heavily black and people of color concentrations to, to affect the outcome of future elections. It, it's, yeah. it, it, we, 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 we can't play the game unless we know the rules of the game. Because if you're trying to play a game and you're depending upon your opponent to tell you what the rules of the game are, <laughs> you better believe you're gonna always lose. You know, you got to you got to know for yourself what the rules of the game are. Well, how is this game played? And that and that is what and that is what we need to do. You know, I I I I'm disheartened by Virginia's outcome on Tuesday, but I'm reminded Virginia was the heart of the Confederacy. You know, make make it whatever you want, but but the the absolute capital of the Confederacy was in Virginia. 
no <laughs> surprise. That's true. I mean, you it moved it from Montgomery up to Richmond. Up to Richmond, and, to and Richmond. when you look and when you look at, at Georgia and what's happening with with Ahmad Arbery, you know Stone Mountain right. still right. in Georgia. Stone Mountain right. still, still in Georgia. Georgia still Georgia, Georgia is still, still Georgia. a clan stronghold. Still Georgia. It's still that's Georgia. They had to say, that's but right. Unless, unless we forget about dear old North Carolina, you know, we still. This is a place where Lord have mercy. Uh, they proudly display the uh, stars and bars, you know, and we and we dispute you on that. I think it comes when we as a people we fail to read or to educate ourselves upon the subject. When Barack Obama was reelected in 2012, you saw 2015 disenchanted black folk because that's so I, I said this is ridiculous because they thought he was going to change everything and one girl just broke down crying I thought he's going to change everything I said does she not realize that that's just one part of government that it is difficult for the executive branch to do anything when you got people from the legislative branch sticking sticks in the spokes of the wheel of progress. And when you've got people, your local uh, governments, your state governments held by people who, 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 who are just hell bent, bound and determined. And this woman was just crying. I said, I wish you would read a book and be able to, you know, as, as, as Obama said, don't boo, vote. Know about the issues. Get out there. It used to be a time you could talk about a party, but somebody said, no, you can't do that. You'll lose your tax exempt status. You're this, that, and the other. But still, they do it all the time. Get out there and educate, educate, educate. Oh, you're time. right, Joe. They would get on us about that. But those big, huge assemblies, you got those preachers in Texas that would tell you, I'm a Trump supporter, vote for Trump, vote for Trump. But you let one of us say something about uh, anything political, you're going to have letters to the bishop, to the governor, and probably to the IRS. About, I, I don't believe politics belongs in the church. We've got to understand that this is something it's not good. It didn't happen overnight, nor would it change overnight. We must continue. The fight continues. The struggle continues. We can take a breather, but we cannot end the process. You know, so we've got to, I mean, we've got to, be, just because they let you attend the University of North Carolina don't necessarily mean you are accepted. You just tolerate it. Tolerate it. It's, it's a sad reality. So, it's all. So the, so if we're going to keep this forward, Focus Thursday. I was just, I was just thinking that, Phil. <laughs> what can we do? What can we do about it? I mean, like, you know, what like, can... like Steve Jr. said, um, you, you know, we, we have to push involvement and we have to teach involvement, involvement at your, your local meetings. I mean, go as far as talking about government, um, even go into your homeowners association meetings, just be involved. Be involved in this stuff because it starts there. It starts Educate. there. Educate. Then it moves because that's where a lot of these ideas, a lot of these ideas are generated in the very neighborhoods in which we live at those meetings like that. People and Joe, you know, it's funny you say that about homeowners associations, because people need to check what the local laws are, because in, in most areas, your home can be repossessed if you don't stay current on your homeowners association. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the, so the, let me look when, when we I had a dispute with my last homeowners association when we lived in Michigan. Mike, you remember? Oh yeah, we learned because they didn't because they were they were just bad. They didn't do it. It was bad. It just was it. It wasn't you know we were paying this exorbitant amount of money, and so I didn't pay them for a few years, and um, they couldn't they didn't do anything. They put a lien. So when I when I went to sell my house, I had to pay that before I could sell my house. So I had to pay them anyway. I was going to say, um, 
my wife, all that, as y'all know, Dr. Christina, uh, she posed a question in the chat about what can we do as adults teach our children about civic engagement and what can churches do to such at, at the end? And I, I would say, you know, for, for me, I actually take, you know, my sons with me, you know, when I actually do go to meetings, what have you. Um, even about five years ago, I served as a delegate to the um, state of Connecticut's um, Democratic Convention. And Stevie was with me. Um, he had to be no more than like, you know, three or four years old, but he was there sitting with me as we was actually going through the process. And people to this day still remember that. So I, I think that's how you really teach them by actually let them tag along. Where Stevie goes with me uh, when we actually have lunch with the fire chief, I, I, I take him. Or if he wants to see the mayor, you know, at, at certain, certain events. So that's how you really get your children involved by you you showing up and take take them along with you so they can actually see, you know, what what's at stake. By example, Let me tell you, Steve. I think we got the better example down there. I'm going to say something to Phil will probably remember. That's what I was going to do in two months. Because I, I, I can still hear this in this for Nick, Nick Galifianakis. I is for integrity. C is for Congress. K is to keep him there. Daddy was working with Nick Galifianakis and also with Shirley Chisholm in 1972 when she ran for president. And he would take us around with him in the car to the various precincts to see how the boats were going and was teaching us about yeah. having pride in the process. He taught us by example. I think it was a proud day for me at W.G. Pearson. They would take the gymnasium and put those rolling uh, machines in there. We couldn't play, but I knew on that day I was going to see Reverend Philip R. Cousin down there coordinating and making sure that persons were showing up to vote around that school and the precincts. I think the best thing is, and you and you learned that, Stephen, by showing by example. You can, you can talk about it, but you got to be about it. And taking your children, showing your children and letting them know that it is important. Why is it important? Because we've placed a priority on it because it is, it is something that, is, that, that, that we cannot take for granted. Too much is at stake, especially now at this juncture of history. And um, you know, I thank daddy for that, mama. I thank mama for that of showing and, and, I, and I was able to teach that to my sons. And even on uh, days of uh, when they have elections, I said, did you all vote? Are you registered? Go vote, exercise your right. I, I just feel, I, I would feel bad if I missed a vote and I didn't, I had a chance to vote, but I just said, no, nah, I, I could do something yeah. else. No, I, I, I mean, it bothers me. So I think that when we lead by example and teach, voter education um, and, and, and to talk about the truth behind the so-called shaded truth. Uh, that's one of the things, th those are things that we can employ to help us move beyond to go forward. But you know Steve, what? Let, let me tell you this, let me tell you this about, your, about your grandfather, even before then, he used to take us, his little boys, downtown when they were doing boycotts in downtown Durham. Yeah. And we would march with him in the boycotts back in the in the in the middle and actually the middle 60s. He would march. And and I can remember once when one of the clan, because the clan used to come down and oppose the boycotts, one somebody, one somebody in the clan called his children a name. And I want you to know that your granddaddy chased that man down the street had a dead run and ran, and, and ran that clucker right on, right on to somewhere else. Uh, you know, I, I remember, I remember when, when, when daddy had that, uh, that, uh, that Delta 88 Oldsmobile, the old Oldsmobile, gold and black, that was, that was, that was stopped one night by the police and the police broke out his headlight and dented up his car. That was in Durham, North Carolina. And it, you know, it, I, it, I, I came back behind him 16 years later 
and got the same death threats from the Ku Klux Klan in 1996 that he was getting in 1966. Nothing, you know, the, 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 the more things change, the, the, more, the, the more time changes, more things just seem to stay the same. It goes around and it comes around. And so what we gotta do is keep it real. That's why don't let it go circular, keep it linear and call folk on it before it gets too bad. And just this morning, just this morning on CNN, I heard a Republican get him justifying, yeah, well, folk love the policies. They, they didn't resonate with his personality and that's something else, but they love the policies of Trump. The policies of Trump were racist. Okay, go. I was gonna say two quick things. Um, number one, my earliest involvement was when, when my mom ran for the um, school board. And it was by like, she ran as a slate um, of six people. She was the only African-American running. And of that slate, only five from her slate got elected. She was the only one left out. Uh, but I remember campaigning with her, but I knew she told me then what happened. But I also remember granddad giving the prayer um, for Barack Obama um, at, at Grant Park. And I had the privilege to actually stand by grandma's side um, during that time. It was a special night. So I, I saw both ends of it where my mom was the first one who drugged me, maybe put brochures on, on doors for her candidacy. And I could see the passion of how she existed for education. And then I could see what granddad did, just his involvement and even you, Uncle Joe, you know, starting your own chapter for the NAACP um, in, in your church. And that you had your very first Freedom Fund dinner. And so I, I see everything, how Uncle Phil served as county commissioner in, in Durham. Um, just to see your, your involvement really inspired me to be the person I am today. You know, it was something at the Chicago Annual Conference that it was for a uh, senator, the race for senator. And at the conference, there was a gentleman no one was talking to, but he was invited to come to speak. He was a member um, of Trinity, United Church of Christ. He came, he was a sharp, polished person. He's standing against the wall. I can see him remembers clear, clear as day. And the favorite candidate who was a member of a church down in Southern Illinois came and talked and everybody talked. And then this candidate came up and daddy introduced him and said, here's a young man that's going, you know, just coming and seeking his office. I think we should give him the same courtesy of speaking to us and letting us know. And I invited him here and, they, and he announced his name and folk, their, draw, their jaws just dropped because his name sounded funny. Barack Hussein Obama. And he came and he spoke for five minutes, told a joke, you know, and was his, his personality was such that he was able to grab us. And you could see he was, he was educated. And as he was walking out, I managed to shake his hand. I said, brother, <laughs> you got a tough way to go with a name like Hussein. He just, he thought that was the funniest thing in the way. He just cracked up laughing. I said, I could get down with somebody like that. Now, the thing is, I, I appreciate the fact that daddy took time out to show us, you know, it is important to be involved in the process because it just so happens those persons may be elected and those are the persons who are gonna chart the course of this country in which we live in. And so I think it is something that we must continue to teach our children and I praise God for raised, being raised in a house with, with teachers to show you the, the, the necessity of, of education. And mama telling us, oh, mama, I need to know, how do you spell this word? She appointed a book, go get it yourself. I thought that was the coldest thing in the world. I said, I hate it. I'm cussing under my breath. Oh, you know it, you can give me the answer right now. There's a dictionary, we got all these dictionaries here. Uh, you know, go get that word and find it and sound it out. And that right there taught us in order to learn, sometimes you got to get it yourself. Mikey, you know what's you know, funny? Right now, Miriam and Joe get on me because every time they ask me a question, I tell them, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, 
I mean, that's the thing to about Google it. everything. Just Google it. Google it. You got to get it yourself. Yeah. And so that's what I think we've lost that. We want everything given to us, but learn to do it. If you have it, you know, someone said, Reverend, what would happen to your degrees if they burn, if, if the building burned down on the wall? I said, it doesn't matter. I got it here. I got, I got the information here. And so I got it for myself. That's just, that's, as KRS-1 would say, that, those are just receipts of the education I paid for. They're just receipts. But I have it here. I'm able to articulate. I'm able to rationalize. I'm able to formulate. I got it for myself. And we must teach our children. Wait, and, and as we, that's a good note to close on because I'm, I'm going to say this. This is for dad. Dad, who'd you get that quote from, yeah. Mike? KRS-1. <laughs> Book it down production. One, what does KRS-1 do for a living? He, 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 is a, he is an activist and he is one an educator. And how do you knowledge rules supreme over nearly everyone? Rapper. That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> That's right. Not you know, BDP, Book It Down Productions. Hey, Amen. Cash rules everything around me. That's another acronym for another phase of it. You know, uh, you Dad, know. Not, not all the rappers are bad, Dad. KRS One, you would like him because he he is he he's 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 a deep thinker. You got some. Not not these new some of these new clown people. I'm not gonna go into that that are out now. But I'm talking about Karis One and and Rakim and dare I say Steve, even Sean Carter. You may know him as Jay Z. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> some some of the whatnot. Jay Z was one dad in in, in his latest where, rhyme where, or, or one of the later ones. Where where is Lil Wayne? Where, where is Lil Wayne? I, oh, Lil Wayne. We're not gonna talk about that. We're not gonna talk about Lil Wayne. We're not gonna talk about that, Steve. That we are going, we are going to discuss minute, that. Wait a minute, Joe. Wait a minute, Joe. You got to give props to the ones that that that, that really started it, man. Talk about Grandmas Flash, Melly Mel, Curtis Blow, Treacherous Three with Cool Mo D. Uh, you got to talk about the Furious Five. You but, know, but you know, Africa Bombada and the Zulu Nation. That, that that is another topic for another day. But I will say, Granddad, it is a it is a one chance. It's chance the rapper. That that's all I will say. It's, rapper, from, right. it's chance the rapper yeah. from Chicago. Jay Z said, Jay Z said, and I'm not gonna use the word to use, but he said, you let these blanks come in the Capitol and put their feet on the desk and act like it's theirs, and you get on me for what I do. <laughs> so, but look, and, then, and and think about it. One of the greatest rappers, let's bow our heads. Pac. Yeah. <laughs> so so would say Biggie. So would say Biggie. Oh. But once again, so the conversation, yeah, that's conversation the for another myself, day. Hey, hey, which, hey, which one am I? I ain't Steve? mad at you. I ain't mad Biggie. at you. All day long. So look, we're gonna we're gonna go, but one thing I wanna say, um my that's my party. Is. Is Thanks everybody for coming Brenda on. Brenda had a baby. Uh <laughs> what is it going? We're talking about. Uh, Thanks. How do you like it? Oh huh? Lord Jesus! They got thanks everybody <laughs> for, for coming down for, for coming on with us today. Uh huh. Um, how happy, do you want it? Happy <laughs> November the third. It is November the third now. I do believe. Hail Mary. Happy and and Michael. What does November the third mean for me, Michael? November. Oh, today he gets his booster. No, not that. What can I start doing today? After 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 oh, Halloween, um, it, 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 it's more Monday, December third, the fourth. Listening to oh, the fourth, today's the fourth, yeah. November fourth. Music. I can listen to Christmas music now. Monday, so now. Monday was Monday was Monday was the first. Tuesday the second. Wednesday the third. Thursday the fourth. Man, they all Christmas. run together. After a while, Christmas. they all run together. It don't much matter. Christmas music. Joe listens to Christmas music, and I wouldn't be surprised next week if he doesn't have his tree up. I won't have the tree up, but we'll have some decorations around something. So I once again, another conversation for another day. But I will say two two shameless plugs. Go watch the movie The Harder They Fall. It's on Netflix. I'm gonna it's watch about that. black cowboys that we never really seen before. I think it's an excellent story produced by Sean Carter. Um, just just to throw that out there. A uh, very good movie to watch. All star cast, Idris Elba, Regina King, um, Jonathan Majors. So I'm just like, you know, yeah, I'm just saying, like, it, it's a great show. And happy early birthday to my mama. She, uh, her birthday is tomorrow. My uncle Cindy is today. They're fraternal twins, but they have two separate days where they celebrate their birthday. His is today. My mom's tomorrow. So happy early birthday, mama. Love you. 
nice. Let me let me let me let me tell you this, Steve, about about that. Why why they should do that? Why black folks should watch that? The black black folks should watch that about the black cowboys because uh, you need to learn that the very term cowboy that has been just a, appropriated by that whole other culture was a was a term of derision. Cowboy was the name given to the former slave black uh, horse horse trainers and horse breakers who came who went out west. They were called cowboys. And cowboy was a was a name of derision. It's almost like Christian. You know, we were called the the, the Christians were first called Christian at Antioch, and it was a name of derision. So look at them, look at him, look at them Christians. And that, that that was not something that that was uh, taken by Christians, it was appropriated by Christians, like the name Cowboy was appropriated. And when you watch that movie, there's a movie also out, I don't know what network it's on now, but watch the movie about Bass Reeves, who was the, who was the first yeah. black yeah. marshal. Yes. First black Ranger. marshal, the, the, the absolute model for the Lone Ranger. Yep. It was a black cowboy named Bass Reeves. Yeah. Former slave. Okay. That's that. That's my uh, addition to your. That's my addendum to your shameless plug. And uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for allowing me this opportunity to be with you again on this Ford Focus Thursday. I want to thank you all for uh, for today's discussion. Uh, remember, the struggle continues, and whenever you need some inspiration, I I, I would I would suggest that you listen to some Parliament Funkadelic Chocolate City. You're in my hey, you're in my you in my lane now. Yeah. So you know what's happening, in CC, and uh, tell you about you know as George Clinton says, you don't need the bullet when you got the ballot. Are you up on the downstroke, CC? So that's what I give to you all today: peace, love, harmony, and uh, let's continue uh, to push on and move forward. Uh, Uncle Joe, I got you beat November first. I listened to Mariah Carey's "I'm All I Want for Christmas Is You." So um, I already started listening to Christmas music already. November 1st, I already started. That's because I raised you. Thank you. <laughs> that is why. Thank you. That is why. And I, did the phrase, a good job. I think the phrase you're going to hear a lot this, this, this season, in my mind, you know, <laughs> there it is. That's it, boy. Merry Christmas. There you go. So <laughs> get right. I, I, I know we hear that about a thousand times, so get ready. Uh, I know Joe's going to play it, so I'm getting ready for it. Well, but here's the thing. My wife won't let me play Christmas music around the house until the day after Thanksgiving. But Miriam, Joe, and I listen to it when she's not around and in the car and everywhere else uh, right now. So it's, it's a little running joke we have in the house. You all ought to quit freezing Nicole out of the Christmas celebration. She don't want to celebrate. She says it's not time yet. Look, she just, she just, she just well, I, I hope that all Thanksgiving I, night, not a day earlier. Well, in, in, in preparing, I, I hope that all we've discussed today, one thing I would urge us to do, do what you can in your local church situations to make certain that the local church always will be a forum for bringing forth the ideas and hopes and expectations for the community. Never lose sight of the fact that the one form that we ought to be able to control where we can and do and act what we are brought into this, into this ecclesiology about freedom, liberation, justice, and love. So make sure you keep this local church as a forum for that. You want to close out in prayer, Dad? Gracious Master, we thank you for this, for this time. Thank you for this day. Keep us strong. Keep us in your way. Never let us stray right nor left. Keep us center focused. We might move forward and hopefully come to the point where your kingdom will be all over the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>